Good evening to everyone. I have to say um, you, you have a great um, choice there for EC and it was really fantastic to hear everybody's answers to those questions. Um, so we have quite a short amount of time to talk about an incredibly complex subject. So I'm going to go straight into it. If that's OK with everyone. Um, uh, we're very lucky today to have two fantastic speakers, Catherine Trebek and Jane Davidson. I know we're lucky because um, a couple of members have contacted me and very excited about today's session, I have to say, um, and really can't quite believe that we have such a good panel. So um, I suppose the, the first thing to do is say why we're here. Uh, as most of our members will be aware, we managed somehow to get wellbeing indicators into the Programme for Government. Um, wellbeing indicators for those who, who may be not so familiar with it um, are a way, I suppose, of challenging the, the, the last maybe, well, more than 50 years of economic um, planning, which particularly in Ireland, uh, but in also in other countries, um, relies hugely on GDP um, and the kind of financial statistical measurement that can be you know, less than useful when it comes to really looking at people's lives. Ireland in particular has a problem with GDP, obviously, because we have so much foreign direct investment. And so, you know, our metrics around this are wildly um, out of kind of uh, um, sync with what's really happening on the ground. And even our GNI star version of trying to control that metric still doesn't really do the job. So as part of, I suppose, our push for, you know, equality and more um, social justice and just transition. Um, I think that, you know, we consider and I don't want to talk um, for Mark in this, but my, myself and Mark are always in cahoots about how we can push forward on well-being indicators. And I think one of the reasons is because I certainly think of it as a parallel and complementary um, piece of, of, uh, of work that the government could do that sits alongside actually um, the climate action plan. So where, you know, we've gotten that over the line now and we are look forward to um, a future where our, our climate and our environment is cared for. Wellbeing indicators could also provide, you know, a, a framework that has oversight and that is quantifiable, that cares for people and society. So with that said, I'm going to um, introduce our two excellent speakers. Um, the first is uh, Catherine Trebek. Uh, Catherine um, has uh, been um, a writer, a researcher, an advocate for economic change. Um, she works with the Wellbeing Economy Alliance um, and uh, has authored a number of books, including The Economics of Arrival. Um, and Jane Davidson, who uh, is currently Pro Vice Chancellor Emeritus at the University of Wales, Trinity St. David. It has been Minister for the Environment and Sustainability in the Welsh Assembly, and that is where um, she introduced some legislation uh, that relates to wellbeing indicators. And I suspect that we can learn a lot from both speakers tonight. So, with um, no further ado, I am going to invite maybe Catherine to say a few words around, I suppose, maybe as an introductory set of points around what challenges we face and, and what do we stand to gain from. Uh, a well-being framework uh, and maybe what are some of the pitfalls? Thanks Nessa and really lovely to be here great great to see everyone and, and particularly to join Jane on this on this discussion it's such an important way to spend a stormy fr Friday night looking forward to the discussion shortly too. I think Nessa one of the biggest challenges is to make the metrics and the frameworks actually matter. Over half OECD countries have a well-being framework Incidentally, all of them are multidimensional, which is, I think, a nice nod to a really holistic, collective, multifaceted definition of well-being, as opposed to a very narrow focus on individual subjective well-being. So that's just a plug to them for the multidimensional collective approach. But even the fact that over half the OECD countries have that well-being framework, does that mean that they're on the road to creating economies that really deliver human and ecological well-being? Well, of course not. So the task now is almost to translate 
those metrics into governing differently and not least in order so that we can harness those levers of government to transform the economy because so much it is the economy that's at the root cause of all those interlocking crises facing our communities and our planet. So as you've said, we need to look at how government conceptualizes success. We need to look at how civil servants take decisions and navigate trade-offs. We need to look at timeframes for planning, for evaluation. We need to look at how departments work together. And we need to look at how we raise and spend money through the budgets. And so if we're thinking what are others doing that might give a hint of what good might look like, there are a couple of examples that we can turn to in terms of this agenda. And I think before I start on those, though, I want to just say that in terms of individual policy instruments or programs, if we're just hunting around and casting our eye out for policies that have the word well-being in the title or in the preamble, we will probably miss some of the best efforts because having a well-being economy, an economy that's designed for human and ecological well-being, it's explicitly about system change. And so that takes us to questions about power, about ownership, about prices, about job quality, about, about different, different business models and so on. But if we're just really focusing, and I think that's important to remember for that, this is not just putting well-being in the title, but if we're going to really focus on translating all those metrics and frameworks and decent dashboards into systems change governing, there are a couple of examples. So I suspect most people have heard of New Zealand's well-being budget, but I think one of the most eye-catching and interest, interesting aspects of that effort is that they have reformed their state sector act to enable cross-departmental working. They have mandated that they report on well-being objectives and performance against them as part, as an integral part of the budget making process so that spending can be directed accordingly by changing the Public Finance Act. If we look at Iceland, their wellbeing framework rides and drives its five year fiscal strategy plans here in Scotland, where I'm based, where the wellbeing economy is an explicit goal of government, our national performance framework is increasingly used, I'd say not really enough yet, but increasingly used to reform design of budgets and budget scrutiny by committees. And that's augmented by equality statements and children's wellbeing impact assessments for all um, policies that the Scottish budget brings in. It's also implementing a Wellbeing and Sustainable Development Act, or bill at the moment, to try and align public spending and public decision making with local and international well-being. And it has got its head around long-term budgeting, long-term policy making, dealing with uncertainty, uncertainty, and then naturally grappling with it. There has to be a case of judgment call and theories of change in its capital budget spending, like most governments, we can do this in our capital budget spending, but for some reason seem to struggle with that in our current spending. So there's a paradox there, and I think there's a lot we can learn from our colleagues who build infrastructure and think long-term inherently. And so my take on some of the key factors of this agenda, sort of looking around the world, is one that it's absolutely necessary to have that high level vision and goal. We need to explicitly recognize that the economy needs to be in service of those well-being goals, not a goal in and of itself. This agenda absolutely needs to encompass inherently environmental considerations in order to be truly multidimensional. And so as of course, not to compromise well-being of people around the world and that of future generations. So thinking perhaps about situating all of this within a carbon budget. Public involvement is vital, whether it's in priority setting, policy development, implementation and evaluation. We need to map and regularly report on and of course disaggregate so we can see the state of play in terms of well-being attainment across all those dimensions. Ministerial responsibility and accountability is really key to ensure that all this is taken seriously. And we need to enshrine this vision, the reporting schedule, delivery mechanisms, planning for reviews and for updates in legislation so that they're hardwired into government processes. And we need sustained championship and independent, ideally politically neutral, sufficiently resourced, this is really key, office to do regular reporting, to undertake additional research, to hold government to account and have relationships with other stakeholders and media. And, and Jane, well, I suspect, talk a lot more about that sort of mechanism. And finally, we need officials across government 
to be supported in this change, to have the sort of tools and guidelines and training to enable them to engage with this new approach to governing, because it is quite a shift. Let's not kid ourselves to their more usual traditional ways of working. And finally, I just want to look specifically at budgets. To me, from the research I've done, I think there are six fundamentals of a wellbeing budget that we should look at. So one is that it's outcomes orientated, not focused on how much we spend or departments, but really focused on the outcomes we're wanting to see, that it's absolutely rights-based, so ensuring minimal levels of attainment for everyone, that it's long-term and it's upstream. So this is about moving away from early intervention to early investment in the sort of enabling conditions people need to thrive. And so politicians like yourselves need to govern as if you mean to stay so that even some of the benefits that will take a while to translate will be supported and implemented. Fifthly, it need, or fourthly, it needs to be preventative. So stopping problems emerging in the first place and not just spending on downstream fixes where so much of our social policy seems to be situated. And again, situated within a carbon budget. So we that do that preventative approach to the environment as well. Fifthly, precautionary, taking that precautionary principle from sustainable development, because on balance, we know enough. Even if the evidence base is not specific to the nth degree, it is sufficiently sound that we can make this sort of spending and policy design accordingly. And finally, as across the board, it has to be participatory. I just wanna finish by saying that budgets are only as good as a policy design that they're aligned to. So we need to ensure that this conversation is not just about metrics, not just about statistics, and not just about the finance minister's calculator, but about an explicitly new approach to how we do the economy. Thanks. Thanks, Catherine. That is a wealth of information in a very short amount of time. And I have lots of questions that I'd like to follow up on, but I'm, I'm mindful that Mark and Jane are going to have a chat in a minute and I want to give people time to come in with questions also. But it, um, and I have to say, I love I love that idea of, you know, governing as if you mean to stay, because I think that we really suffer from that in Ireland, that kind of five year outlook and, and a, an annualized budget. So 12 months to 12 months. And then and then every government is just governing for five years. And I, and I think sometimes as a political party, we're often talking about 10 years and 20 years and 30 years in the future. And, and there's sometimes a, a mismatch. We're, we're, we're talking at, at opposite ends to what everybody else is doing. Um, if I can just prompt you on one issue. Um, we struggle in this country, I think, sometimes uh, around the issue of regionalization. We have one very, very large, uh, you know, Dublin is a very large, it's a very large city compared to the rest of the country. And then you have some, you have Cork and, and Galway and Limerick, but really then you have a quite a significant rural divide, which looms large on, on the green landscape in terms terms of something that we have to address seriously. My question would be, do you think that well-being economies um, are better suited to kind of a regionalized approach or a, a kind of a decentralized approach? Can that be effective? Or do you think the kind of the necessary um, organization of data um, would make it a more centralized system? Well, I think both in a way, because I think we should recognise that some of the key levers of change are likely to sit with central government. Things like employment law, questions of business ownership, some of the taxation, but that's not to say that's the full picture. So what sort of powers are devolved to more local authority level or even beneath that to perhaps more community level is absolutely vital as well. So things like transfer of assets, participatory budgeting, planning and procurement so we can design what sort of businesses are situated in local economic ecosystem, that should all be locally determined through that lovely principle of subsidiarity. So that's, that's vital. But I I think the question of sort of spatial imbalance that you also were talking about, if we properly disaggregating data, we should see the sorts of imbalances that you're talking about and then design and divert spending and changes accordingly. So to give you one quick example, Bhutan, which of course in this space is famous for its gross national happiness, its surveys revealed that rural communities were falling behind the sort of the main urban to the extent that Bhutan has urban conurbations, but rural communities were falling behind in terms of its nine domains of well-being. And so instead of of prescribing sort of meant in, in terms of well being, instead of prescribing cognitive behavior therapy or mental health treatment services, you know what they did is they started working on the connectivity 
so that rural communities were not so isolated. That's the sort of thing that really looking upstream that this approach demands of us will take into account. Also, as an aside, they also found that women were falling behind. And again, instead of prescribing treatments and therapies, they worked to invest in women's setting up businesses and women's political empowerment as well. And again, that's the sort of not just taking the symptoms on face value and prescribing individually orientated interventions, but really looking to the root causes that this approach demands of us. It's essentially daring to ask why and taking our gaze upstream and acting there, not just doing that sticking plaster downstream remedial fixing and healing approach that we so often see in social policy. That's fascinating. Um, okay, Mark, if it's okay with you, I'm gonna hand over um, to yourself and Jane. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm going to particularly thank Jane because while we're all giving up our Friday evening is above and beyond the call of duty and I want to thank her very much for that. <clears throat> um, so a lot of what Catherine was talking about was, I suppose, how we translate a well-being framework into actual action on the ground. And uh, our department, Taoiseach here, has produced the first pass of a well-being framework that both NASA and I were, were pleasantly surprised by. We were pleasantly surprised that there's somebody working within that, within the permanent government, who, who clearly gets it and has, has driven forward with quite a degree of work. There's two areas of concern that I'd have. So there's a cultural and, ling and linguistic concern that I have particularly because I have a, a great love of the Irish language. And I know Wales have done something very interesting in that. And, and if we have time, we may be able to unpack some of that as well. But the second thing, and our own uh, parliamentary budget, budgetary office, the PBO here in Ireland, has pointed to it that um, if we want this to be meaningful, if we want the well-being uh, indices or framework to be meaningful, and Catherine averted to this as well, we have to find a way to put it on a statutory basis so that there's a, a legal need for departments and public bodies to act. And, and Jane, that's that's where the work that you did um, as minister in the, in the Welsh Assembly, I think is so important, um, not just putting wellbeing indicators for today on a statutory basis, but giving that forward facing and future element, which speaks to spending money early and, and downstream spending that, that Catherine was talking about. And so you introduced this wellbeing of future generations act, which I think you're going to present to us to, to give us a sense of some of the detail that's in it. Well, hello. Um, good evening to you all. Noswitha Ihigid and doing Bach Yauni Dotama have you. I'm absolutely delighted to be uh, joining you here uh, in Wales. Well, not from Wales, actually, from a corner of Spain, but uh, to tell you a little bit about uh, the Welsh Act. And, and I, I think just to just to start, I, I wish I'd met Catherine <laughs> before I uh, did the work that has now turned into the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act. But I hope you'll agree when you have a look and think about the, the, some of the um, uh, elements that she's just highlighted that uh, the work of all those who contributed towards the act has actually picked up all those very important points that Catherine has made in terms of what, what a statutory well-being framework needs to look like um, at, its, at its most basic. And I say that because I'm not advocating, and I really want to get this over at the beginning, I'm not advocating the Welsh Act to other countries. I'm advocating that every country has a well-being of future generations act that is fit for purpose in its own country. And that's a really important difference because I was deeply shocked to find that as somebody who's now 10 years out of frontline politics, that Wales is still the only country in the world that has legislation that protects future generations, is still the only country in the world to have an independent commissioner who can actually call not just the public sector to account, but government as well. So I just thought it would be useful in, in terms of the things that you're grappling with and knowing that your um, foreign minister was over in Wales a fortnight ago talking to our first minister saying he loved the act and he's really interested in doing something like it in Ireland. I feel that the, 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 time, the time is now right. So I'm gonna share my screen. Um, 
and just to check that you can see it. So this is a shorthand of what the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act looks like. Um, it, although it was passed in 2015, it arose out of a duty to promote sustainable development. And I can tell you that you could deliver on a duty to promote on any day of the week. And I tried really hard to turn a duty of promote to a duty to deliver. And I came to the conclusion that without that statutory framework, you're never gonna make it happen. And the point that Catherine made about you know, all, every politician should be acting as though they're going to be there forever. I think every politician in acting as though their influence needs to influence current and future generations. Because in that way, there is a legacy whereby I will have long gone, but I hope that young people in Wales in seven generations will know they live in a different country because politicians were prepared to take this step. So what you see here is the picture of Wales, the 17 SDGs round the outside, the seven goals that are Wales interpretation of the SDGs and the points that Catherine made about being long term, preventative, collaborating with each other, integrating the outcomes of the goals and involving people about whom decisions are being, are being made. In Wales, it's not just the goals that are the law, it is these ways of working as well. So you can be called to account if you're not doing that. And I'm pretty confident that our independent commissioner is sharpening her knives for a couple of public sector organizations this coming year, because they've now had five years to get to grips with this act. And some of them are perhaps not doing as much of these things uh, as they might for the future. The other core component of this, are the goals themselves. And as, as you said at the beginning, Nessa, and as Catherine has said, and Mark has, uh, has, has indicated, this is not about a carbon uh, reaction. This is about what does prosperity look like when you have both a carbon and ecological emergency? And therefore the first two goals, the prosperous whales and the resilient whales are directly related to those two. It has to be innovative, it has to be low carbon, it has to protect decent work, it has to enhance biodiversity, it has to support healthy functioning ecosystems, it must act on climate change, but it must do it within the ecological boundaries in which we operate. But we wouldn't be able to work on those if we didn't also want to tackle inequality, upstream look at health, not about how quickly the ambulance gets to you, although that's a big issue in Wales at the moment, I can tell you now, but it's about how do we maximize people's physical and mental well-being and the choices and behaviors that create that? How do you create safe communities? And that's country and city. And I know what's very, very important to you too, is a, a Wales of vibrant culture and thriving Welsh language. How do you protect a country's culture, heritage, and languages and encouraged people to participate and develop that. And we've just literally uh, in the last few days had a coalition between the Labour government and Plaid Cymru, um, the uh, National Party of Wales, to look at a whole range of issues, one of which is to have a major culture review as part of the new agreement that actually will expand many Welsh language options, but also will look at the other uh, languages in Wales, the history of Wales, getting it into the curriculum, the multi-ethnic natures as well. And to make sure that you're responsible, a globally responsible Wales cannot um, shift the burden onto others. And I think this is so important because many countries at the moment are, for example, buying up land. They're buying up land in Wales and we know they're going to try and offset bad behaviour in their own country by offsetting trees in Wales. That cannot happen under this act. Wales cannot pass its problems off somewhere else. So you couldn't start a coal mine, you couldn't frack, you couldn't do a, create a new um, a gas infrastructure in Wales because of this act. And I think that the re really important element of it is that it makes for good behavior because it doesn't matter what party you come from. You've all got to do this, but how you do it might vary at different parties. 
And I've just, because I spent 10 years thinking this through, I've written a book which has a, a small, I said to Mark the other day, a small but discerning audience of people who are really interested in, in the why promotion is not enough, why policy is not enough, but why I had to propose that this got turned into law, because without that, there would not be a statutory basis to the protection for future generations. And that, that is the bit that is attracting other countries around the world at, at the moment. And I know they'll do it differently. And I'm really looking forward to a future generations competition <laughs> where we compete for how much we can do for those generations that generally we've given them their, our problems, not our solutions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much for that presentation, Jane. Um, <clears throat> and uh, it's a pity we don't have an in-person convention because I was rather hoping to get my uh, my copy of your book signed. And thanks for calling me a discerning audience. I'm not sure that's a compliment that I would often get. Jane, I, I've been reading your act in detail. It's absolutely where Ireland should be going if we want to be really serious about implementing wellbeing framework. Um, I just want to kind of give you an opportunity. So there's some very specific things that your act does. Um, it implements a future generations commissioner, which I think is really important. Um, it, it puts a, an obligation on public bodies, which is also very important. And you also define a sustainability principle. And that's kind of front and center at the act, uh, at, the, at the beginning of the act. Um, Maybe because that's there's a lot in that, but maybe if I could ask you specifically about the functioning of the the office of the well-being, the future well-being commissioner, because I think that's a really important policy lever that you built in. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. I mean, I think it's interesting the picks that the the, the areas you you've picked out there, Mark, because my ten years of experience in government in terms of trying to implement this duty to promote meant that. I was able to look back at that experience and think, what are the absolute essential elements of making um, a law work? And one was that government itself had to be accountable to such a law. Governments normally make laws for others. And it was really important that the government should be accountable. So there had to be uh, accountability mechanisms. Now, the audit um, mechanism is obviously a classic one for government and public services, um, but there had to be an independent future generations commissioner who has powers, powers of intervention, powers of naming and shaming, but also can be a really important critical friend, particularly in the early years. And I wouldn't be surprised if over time the powers of the person who holds that job will change because as people start to understand more what they need to do to deliver on the legislation, there will be precedents in the courts. And those precedents will lead undoubtedly to a different kind of set of powers for that commissioner. But we tested it when I was minister. And, one, and because it wasn't statutory, it was like, it was policy, it was advisory. And the commissioner did not have sufficient teeth to be able to hold anybody publicly to account in a way that was part of a process. And I think the, 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 one of the key aspects for me about getting a law like this right is the process is as much as the event. And normally we don't think about that. We think of a law and that solves the problem. But unless you have a process by which people really understand what they're meant to do, when they're meant to do it, how they're meant to do it, then you don't actually align the two. And it was very, very important to me that we aligned it with the Brundtland principle. So it was very much about ensuring that we enabled future generations to meet their own needs because we'd not compromised that by removing that opportunity. Um, and that was there at the beginning. It was a founding constitutional issue for Wales. And for me, all I did by proposing this legislation was take that principle and say, we couldn't deliver it the other way. If we're gonna deliver this, this is the only way you can deliver it. 
And there are other aspects to it, like there are still debates over what are the indicators that, de that demonstrate how you deliver on it. But the most important elements are that tying together of the process and the outcomes, independently verified and assessed through both an audit process and the Future Generations Commissioner. And the really exciting thing that's being developed at the moment is the Act only works in the context of the public bodies accountable to the Welsh Government. But there is a new procurement mechanism that means that whenever any of those bodies now procure, the private sector has to do it too. And that's how we, we make the change. So even on the areas where we do not have power, we can have power and influence by the use of that public power. Something that really interests me about this act, Jane, and, and about you and, and how you've, the work that you've done as a politician, it's very rooted in philosophy and principle, but it's also extremely practical in the extreme. Um, and, it, you know, even in terms of there's provision for a commissioner, but you've made sure that that office is well resourced as well. Um, so it's not just a fig leaf. You've, you've really, from my reading of the Act, in any case, you've really understood those levers that you need to build into law in order to make sure that a well-being framework is really and meaningful implement, meaningfully implemented on the ground. And I think it's a great template for other countries to follow. And as you say, it's a, it's a great surprise that con other countries haven't followed quicker. And if I can just finish this session, so there's time for questions in, um, uh, in the context that, you know, effectively what I did was I did the learning in my, in my um, you know, 12 years in, in government. And then I left the bomb for the next generation. But what is so amazing is that next generation picked it up. So all those things that I, I felt had to be there in the legislation, it had to have the independent commissioner. It had to be about delivery, not about promotion. Um, it had to be independently auditable and to go to the courts and the government had to also be accountable. I put those in the proposition and every single one of those survived. And the only reason they survived was because we tested and tested and found that without those elements. So actually your point about being practical, Mark, is learning from what you know is not working. And then using Catherine's phrase, always looking upstream of the pro problem, because generally in politics, and I'm, I'm, I'm sure I've been guilty of it many times myself, we look downstream, we try and sort the immediate problem, and then we get a perverse outcome, and then we try and sort that perverse outcome. And then suddenly we're 10 years on, and we're actually further away from our goal <laughs> than we were before. And I just thought, this is a Mandela moment, as it were, because it's Mandela's one of my massive, massive heroes. And he, and he said, Vision without strategy is just a dream. Strategy without vision just passes the time. But with vision and strategy, you can change the world. And, and an act like this, and you, you will have a different one in Ireland, but I hope it'll have many of the same components when you're able to do this. It will be that, that marriage of vision, of strategy, of identity, of culture, and passion. Mark, could I just come in on the point about indicators there? Is that, is that all right? <laughs> yeah, go ahead, Catherine. So, so I think Jane's made a really powerful point there of, of just how much the policy context and momentum and path dependencies so often direct us towards downstream sticking plaster territory. And, and the sad perverse incentives bound up in GDP is that GDP rewards us the more we're spending on patching up and it doesn't smile when we get things right first time around because GDP won't go up if people are safer and healthier in their communities and we're not spending money, you know, cleaning up after car accidents or, or spending money on mental health treatments because of precarious work and undignified work. GDP does not credit us when we do when we do the job right so it shows some of the perverse incentives bound up in it but of course there are loads and loads of measures and metrics out there we know the health of our rivers we know sort of inequality in terms of 
economic sense. We've got all sorts of figures around air quality, around homelessness levels and so on. We've got plenty of beyond GDP indices out there and someone's once described it as almost the wild west of beyond GDP initiatives. So there's lots out, out there. I think one of the challenges is that so often this metrics debate starts really well intentioned because it starts ultimately with that premise and that goal of improving life for communities. And then it, when it translates into practical action, it so often becomes a fairly technical conversation around dashboards and indicators. And so often, you know, most times when normal people are talking about dashboards and indicators, they're talking about their car, not their quality of life. And so often I have this sort of dream because it's Friday night. I hope you'll forgive me for sharing this. But I have, I have a dream project that will, will develop maybe half a dozen or so what I call cornerstone indicators that close that feedback loop back to communities so that they have to pass two hurdles. So one is that they correlate with multi-dimensional well-being, all the various aspects that are important, and you can develop that through community consultation and through leaning on the literature. But they also have to pass another hurdle, is it that, and that's that they make intuitive sense to everyday communities. They resonate with people's vision and for their own lives, and they see themselves in that to build the political demand and the political engagement and that accountability that Jane talked about. And to give you an example, this is just my thought, it may not pass those two tests, but my example to illustrate that is imagine if we had, say, mayor, local mayors going into their local authority elections saying, under my watch, I'm going to focus on increasing the number of girls who ride their bikes to school. Because imagine all the beautiful contextual things that are in place for that number to go up. Streets are safe, parents can afford bicycles, they've probably been able to provide breakfast for their kids. There's local schools on an international con context, girls are going to school and so on. And so if you had say half a dozen of those sorts of figures, you start to engage the public in this conversation because so they see themselves there. So I think we need to also pay attention to making sure these measures really resonate on their own, on their own worth with people and people's lives so that we build that chain of accountability and engagement around them. I love that Catherine, the idea that it, it should be an intuitive system and, and that it's legible for people and they can understand it and really engage with it. Um, I am going to open up for, for questions and um, people can put it in the, in the question box there. Um, and I'm mindful that we're at 2043 and that there's some, I think the leader speech is at nine and uh, for our, our non-Irish guests, <laughs> shall I say, the late, late toy show starts at half nine. So I daren't go too far over time. Otherwise we'll all be in serious trouble with every parent on the call. Um, so the first question I, I see in the chat is um, from Michael Ewing, who is our chair of policy. Um, how do you see the top down process being developed in national government and the bottom up well-being vision already being developed by public participation networks across the country? So for so, so sorry for, for Catherine and Jane, we have a public participation network, which is a way for, you know, average mm -hmm. citizens and constituents and residents to um, it's often, you know, you get a membership through a particular community group. Um, and I'm, I'm, I might pass this over to Mark as well. Um, so there has been a project around, you know, from the bottom up, what a vision for well-being would be. So Mark, maybe, maybe you might want to start us off there and, and we might bring in some further comments then. Yeah, well, I think I think an important part of a well-being framework, and I I would note as well that Jane uh, in in the Future Generations Act does also talk about placing responsibility on local authorities and that subsidiarity principle, and I do think it's very important that we build capacity within our within our communities. Uh, this is a framework, uh, the same as climate action, the same as any large project within a society. It it. It can be directed from the top, perhaps, but it must have the buy-in of the local community. And really, you should always be trying to build that community capacity. I've had, uh, well, I, I would have, I suppose, entered into politics through the PPN network. Um, I think they're a great way of kind of linking communities together to discuss particular topics, whether they need to be reinforced and strengthened, I think they probably do. But I do think that the, the work that the PPN network, and I think it was five PPNs, Michael knows this far better than I do, um, who really led out on producing that kind of well-being framework within PPMs, 
I think that was a great work and a great template that we absolutely should learn from as we begin to formalize and really uh, make concrete our own plans for a well-being framework. Can I, um, I think one of the things that I thought of when I, when I saw the question um, was we were, we were actually very lucky on timing in Wales because from the beginning of the National Assembly for Wales, it's now, it's now a fully fledged parliament um, as of two years ago, but the National Assembly for Wales when it started in 1999, we did set up frameworks for partnership which, with each of the sectors. So there's a very active local government framework and partnership, a very active um, uh, you know, third sector partnership as well. And they were really important on that, no that notion of having collaborative activity between government. Because um, in a small country, we're only, we're, you know, we're, we're talking about um, just over 3 million population, but it can still feel a long way away from North to South Wales, etc. So having, having those mechanisms, but of course, those are the professional interface with government. They're not the communities. And I think that where we were very lucky in the Wellbeing Future Generations Act is while I was a minister, we did huge amounts of work. We consulted and had a massive input at, right down at the smallest community level across Wales for over a year back in 2009 when I first proposed that we should have sustainable development as the central organising principle of government. And then when the UN did its the world we want consultation, Wales was able to piggy on back on that with the Wales we want consultation and got virtually the same um, uh, aspirations from Welsh society four years later. So I think that, that you know, there needs to be really good consultation at the lowest possible level with communities if you're going to do something this big because those communities have to feel they've got a real stake in this and to be the champions. And our big issue in Wales is all the people who know about the act, love it, and just want to hold the public services to account because they don't think they're doing it well enough. And people who don't know about the act are really shocked to find that they have this opportunity to hold the public services to account. So I think that the, you know, in small countries, there's a particular opportunity to marry the top and the, I, I don't, never think about it as the bottom, but actually the core of our, of our lives and livelihoods in the communities in which we live. Okay, um, I absolutely agree. And I, I think everybody in Ireland would love the idea of holding those services to account. That sounds like a bit of a dream sometimes. Um, so the next question is from uh, Bobby Lambert. Great to see this framework in place. We need to have the right metrics for society. As a political party, we need to put emphasis on this. So our electorate can see we are truly a whole of society party working for well-being, fairness and a better world for all, not just a narrow green issues party. In that light, maybe we can do more to highlight the potential for unconditional basic income in supporting a well-being agenda. So I suppose that the larger question there is, um, and I'm a great proponent of, of uh, basic income, I have to say, are there particular kind of fairly forward, forward looking um, policy positions that you think complement wellbeing frameworks? Well, we're about to pilot it in Wales. I mean, Catherine knows much more about the wider, but I mean, it's exactly, it's the, it's the permission to think differently. If you pass an act like this, then actually suddenly all sorts of amazing ideas, four day weeks, universal basic income, roads review, because actually we want to put our money into um, looking at low carbon vehicles, you know, all sorts of things that I've been fighting for for years and never saw the light of day. Suddenly they're tumbling over each other in policy terms. So over to you. <laughs> What, what I'd add to that is that, I mean, I think UBI, like so many other policies, are necessary but not sufficient on their own. And I think we need to grapple with it. This is actually a jigsaw puzzle of a whole wide range of different policies, different pr changes in practices, different programs and shifts, and perhaps even removing and, and repealing some of the policies that are already out there that are counter to this agenda as well. And so to sort of grapple with 
that plethora of shifts that are needed. I, I sort of think about like anyone who does a good jigsaw puzzle will know that you start with the corners, yeah? So so I, I think about my my four corners of that jigsaw puzzle to build a wellbeing economy are what I describe as the four Ps. So purpose, so really changing the goal of the economy away from GDP's ill-deserved perch to things like collective wellbeing through the sort of frameworks we're working on. Prevention, so really looking upstream and things like outcomes budgeting rather than just paying to patch and repair pre-distribution so essentially asking the economy to do more of the heavy lifting in designing equal outcomes from the beginning but also more sustainable outcomes so the more circular and renewable economy you have the less carbon capture sequestration and storage you need the fewer beach cleanups you need the more worker cooperatives and minimum minimum wages and maybe even maximum wages the more community wealth building you have the more you get the economy in its own note to generate the sort of outcomes we want and we then ha don't have to redistribute so much with all the political machinations that requires and then the final corner the final piece people powered so things like participatory budgeting citizens assemblies that Scotland so often looks to Ireland for inspiration on those sorts of things that making sure people really feel that they're at the forefront of the design of the economic system so it's a whole plethora and just Bobby I'd say UBI yeah vital but not on its own sufficient it doesn't it's not a silver bullet and there is no one silver bullet unfortunately because we would have pulled it out and run with it a long time ago if it was that simple yeah i, I think we are our, our mantra here is universal basic income absolutely but also universal basic services yeah that, 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 that's the, um so the next question is from dan boyle can i ask catherine and jane if they seek a link cancer dan boyle excuse me dan uh, can i ask Ka catherine and jane if they see a link between participatory budgeting and well-being indicators so i, I think we have touched on this a little bit yeah, but I, I know some of our counselors have introduced at local level participatory mm -hmm. budgets and it has sometimes met with fairly you know kind of worry from the council that you, you know you're, you're kind of removing i suppose power from them um, and and possibly, you know, introducing a little bit of dynamism or like a kind of a dynamic into it that they're not so sure about. Hence, we should bring it on. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, this, we all um, agree with participatory budgeting. Yeah, I think just 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 very briefly, I think I think all, all of these things are to some extent a learning curve. You know, we're used to actually budgeting happening in an office somewhere over there. And then what we have to do as ministers is fight for our corner <laughs> and actually, once again, take it upstream, actually look at what does a budget being delivered according to the principles of the well-being of future generations that look like and make that the test. And then the corners being fought for the policy and the outcomes, not for the individuals. And it's a really, really important question. I think I think it was Martin Luther King, what reportedly Martin Luther King, who said government budgets are moral documents with numbers attached. Yeah. And if they are being designed in some stuffy airless room with only government officials present, then you can imagine the <laughs> almost inherent immorality of that. We need to have these that black box of budget making really cracked open and make it as participatory as possible. And wouldn't it be imagined, for example, if at the start of the process, you saw finance ministers sitting down with young school kids and talking about their future. And this comes back to Jane's point around the participation and attending to the barriers, the inherent barriers in participation, because you open sort of the floodgates of a, a consultation and the, who is at the front of the queue, often folks who are always at the front of the queue. So really paying attention to making sure it's as inclusive and as as diverse as possible but also the, the way we ask questions are really crucial so about 10 years ago I led a project when I was working with Oxfam developing a, a, essentially an alternative measure of progress for Scotland called the Humankind Index and um, tiny tiny humble little project but the question we asked there was what do you need to live well in your community and that yielded very, very local and very immediate sort of answers. And in hindsight, and this is the one time I'll use the word happy because I'm not a fan of the happiness agenda. But I, in hindsight, I wish we'd ask something like, what sort of country do we need for your grandchildren to be happy? To really look long term and look more macro. So really framing the question is absolutely key as well to get folks in that headspace. But that's where that deliberation that things like citizens assemblies and PB really cultivates is so vital.
And of course, we, we love a citizens assembly here. I prefer content maybe to happy. <laughs> um, Sean O'Conlon uh, has a question. The importance of vision, passion and culture in the transformation has been well stated. How can the Greens in government and beyond seize the opportunity to create and mobilize the energy? So I, I suppose really that, that's about the communication of this to the general public. I know um, actually Sean and I would often have talked about uh, the cultural and the linguistic aspect. Sean would be very much a, an Irish language advocate as well and uh, believes in the strength of culture to, to help transform our society as well. And I do think, and I, I, I did say to Jane that if we get a chance at all, I'd, I, I would love the opportunity to kind of just draw attention to the fact that, that Wales really set a language and culture dimension within their wellbeing framework and not in isolation, but made it suffuse the other uh, six elements of that of that well-being uh, framework and I think it's it's certainly something that I look from the outside in I, I look with great envy on um, so yeah I'd be interested to, to hear Jane's response to this question. Um, thanks I just I'd, I think I, I'd, I'd want to say two things here the one is that I remember one of our um, uh, Welsh language ministers um, saying to me that if, if you're going to say hello to somebody and have a conversation in Welsh and you just meet them in the road, the area has to have 74% of people who can speak Welsh for that to be the norm. And I remember being deeply shocked by that because I live in one of those areas, doing Gatli Sharagamrai, doing the Nadio. Um, Gamrai Pob I, I I I use Welsh um, most days of my life, but I know that I would I I would be very unlikely to bump into that many people who could speak Welsh, and I'm in one of the uh, of the most Welsh speaking parts of Wales, so I just think that there is a really important issue for any country that wants to preserve a minority language, and in Wales. And we know it's a minority language in numbers, but for us, it's not a minority language. It is an equal language. We have two statutory languages through which we conduct business in Wales. And that was a really, really important decision that was taken with the first Welsh Language Act and the establishment of a Welsh language commissioner with very strong statutory powers. And now in this partnership with Plaid Cymru, this is going to become even stronger. Because just as I was saying that you could influence those bodies that are not directly linked um, to the powers of the Welsh government through procurement, you can also do it through requirement on language standards. So the new language standards in Wales will apply to the water companies um, and to, uh, for example, housing associations as well. So it's really important that you never let up on the issues where you know if you let up, you're going to lose ground. And it's a very, very important statement about Wales, um, our love of its being a bilingual and in fact, a multilingual country, but very proudly bilingual. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think most people on this call would be very passionate about that. Um, so, well, we are coming up to the very end. There's one very quick question and, and then I'm going to let Catherine come in for a second. Um, from Liz Coakley Wakefield, would well-being include diet for health of us and the planet? Yeah, ab absolutely. G given so how integral the food system is, not only to our planetary health, but also to our own personal well-being, and it's a, such an important lever of change. I just want to reflect on the first part of Sean's question, though, around the role of you know, Greens in government. One of the things I'd love to encourage all your colleagues in the in Green Party to really push for is to encourage. Ireland to join the Wellbeing Economy Governments Partnership that's currently Scotland, New Zealand, Iceland, Wales and Finland and essentially it's about bringing together governments to share learnings and collaborate on putting collective wellbeing at the heart of economic policy making. I'm really hoping we can get to seven governments because then we can call it the We Seven as a little nudge to the, the G7. So it'd be great to have Ireland part, part of those conversations in due course. So I'm going to hand back to Hazel in a moment for, for the next session. Um, and certainly uh, we will be um, 
<laughs> getting onto our own uh, parliamentary party and, and the party at large on, on that, Catherine. And just to say to both our guests, and of course, Mark, who has dropped off now, I suspect, um, thank you so much. And uh, first of all, you, you might find us in your inboxes again, asking more questions. And you, you've both been a huge wealth of knowledge and just um, a, 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 an incredible resource. And we do feel like we have come part of the way and, and one part of the political argument, but it's a long road to get to that integrated well-being framework with lots of oversight and really thread it through all the parts of government and it's no small feat so um yes you, you might be <laughs> sorry you made friends with us because <laughs> we will be looking you up further um and i just thank you very much for your time